Hey, good morning. Welcome to Open Mics with Dr. Stites. It's Wednesday, November the 23rd, the day before Thanksgiving. I'm Dr. Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer at the University of Kansas Health System. We're thankful you're with us today. 30 million Americans of all ages suffer some kind of hearing loss. Put me in that category. For many, a hearing aid is the answer. But that has historically required a prescription from a doctor and a fitting from an audiologist, just like eyeglasses. Until now. Congress passed a law requiring the FDA to create a whole new kind of hearing aid that people can buy at the drugstore without a prescription, which could save thousands of dollars. But is it a good idea? Are you going to get the right fit? Will it really help your hearing? Where can you go wrong? Our guests, our guests today are going to help us sort through the changes that have transformed the hearing aid market. Joining us remotely is Dr. Jim Lin, an ear, nose, and throat surgeon here at the University of Kansas Health System. And with us in the Dolph Simons Jr. Family Broadcast Studio is Dr. Christina Fletcher, an audiologist and ENT here at the Health System. Thanks to you both for joining us oh, this yes. morning. I am so excited to have this program that I know I'm going to learn, especially because you know I have a lot of hearing loss and problems too. So this is perfect. Questions from our viewers are an important part of this program. We want to hear from you. Get your sent in to us now on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and the Medical News Network. You'll find those links right here on your screen. Alexis Del Cid will join us a little later with those questions. Dr. Lynn, these first over-the-counter models are expected to look a lot like the devices you can get through a hearing professional. But there are some important differences. Talk to us about what those differences are. Well, when you get a hearing aid through a hearing professional, um, you typically get the exam in person and then the audiogram performed in a soundproof booth with, um, with standardized and calibrated equipment. Um, and then when you purchase a hearing aid from a hearing professional, typically it comes in a bundled package where you get service for anywhere between, say, one to four years included in that package. When you buy one over the counter, it's more of a self-serve type of device where you typically download your own app online and you don't get the exam. You usually get some sort of app based hearing test where they try to fit it or automatically fit it for you that way. Um, some of the hearing aids that you get over the counter these days come with bells and whistles and some don't and so some are pretty pretty standard and bare. Um, but what it does is take the middleman out of it and that's the reason why for a large part of it they cost much less. Dr. Fletcher is an audiologist. You give hearing tests to patients. Earlier this week, we sent Alexis Del Cid to show how simple it is to get a hearing test here at the health system. I'm here with audiologist Dr. Katie Plum, and Dr. Plum is going to show me how easy it is to get my hearing tested here at the health system. Where are you taking me? You're going right into the hearing booth. Soundproof? Soundproof. How often should someone get their hearing tested? Um, a good standard is every two to three years if you have normal hearing. Ears are nice and clear. Beautiful. You are going to push the button when you hear some tones, but I will put these earphones in, go over there and talk you through it. About how long does the hearing test take? They take about 10, 15 minutes. All right, we are gonna start with tones. When you hear a sound, push the button, even if it's very, very soft. Now, I'm going to say some words that get softer. Repeat them back to me as best you can. I'll start in your left ear. Airplane. Airplane. Popcorn. Popcorn. Hot dog. Hot dog. Okay, the next words are going to be louder and recorded. You'll hear a man say, say the word, repeat the last word, low. Owl. I'm gonna put a piece behind your right ear. We'll continue to push the button to the tones. What does this one do? This is bone conduction, so it's stimulating your inner ear directly, going behind the eardrum straight to the cochlea. So I'll be interested to see if you notice anything because a lot of my friends in the news, they have slight hearing loss in the ear where they wear their earpiece. I would say uh, you have a high frequency hearing loss in both ears, a mild loss in the left, and a moderate loss in the highs. Most likely for you, it makes a lot of sense. It probably was your earpiece. Thanks, yeah. Dr. Palm. Yeah, you're very welcome. 
Dr. Lin, how does someone know when they need a test? Well, typically it begins when you're having problems communicating in background noise. That's the first thing that I have found to really go. Um, and a lot of times it's people's friends or relatives that complain to them that they can't hear. And so not uncommonly, I'll see a patient who's brought in by their significant other or their children saying, you know, my mom or dad can't hear. And so that, uh, that's usually the typical sign that you're missing important things. Um, and somebody else may have to bring that up to you. So it's not just a joke then that when my wife says, uh, you know, can you, do, you, do you ever hear what I'm saying to you? That maybe it could actually be a medical problem. It's not just, you know, maybe I'm ignoring her. That's true, but in, uh, it, that's a very common complaint as well, and, and I tell patients I can't fix selective hearing, so. <laughs> I said selective hearing loss is more of a problem, huh? Yeah. So, Dr. Lin, what is that hearing loss? How do, you, how do you differentiate, like, what's normal aging? Like, okay, I got a little older, and what is something that's more accelerated? How can we distinguish that? There are some age-related norms that are out there and, and fairly well established. However, it, how rapidly you lose your hearing depends on your genetic makeup. And also, um, getting a, a history is important to determine if, if the speed of hearing loss and the degree of hearing loss is, is due to other causes such as extensive noise exposure or uh, chronic hearing disease, or even sometimes some autoimmune diseases or, or subtle infections can cause hearing loss. Yeah, that makes sense. So Dr. Fletcher, if people forgo a hearing test and opt to get an over-the-counter device, what should they expect? So we actually don't recommend foregoing a hearing test. We recommend anybody that has um, any kind of hearing loss or difficulties hearing to make sure that they get that hearing test by an audiologist so that way you know exactly what's going on with your hearing. We can um, direct you in the right direction as far as seeing Dr. Lin if it's a surgical case or um, going the over-the-counter route if you have that mild to moderate hearing loss or going more prescriptive hearing aids um, if that's what your lifestyle entails. So is it your sense, this is getting the right hearing aid, talk to how crucial is that? Because like, like I've been wearing glasses since I was in the fourth grade and I'm kind of not very visually good without them on. And um, if I don't go get them tested every now and then I'll get headaches and chat. I mean, it's hard, right? Mm -hmm. And so you gotta, you gotta stay in tune with that. If you don't get your hearing tested, how do you know you're gonna get the right hearing aid fit? That's kind of the, the difficulties with um, what we're seeing with over-the-counter. They're meant for those specific patients that have mild to moderate, that have a little bit of problems. Um, they're not having issues all day long. They just need a little bit of volume. Um, so it's very specific to a particular patient. Um, that's why getting your hearing test to know exactly how, how severe or how your hearing loss looks is important. So do the hearing aid restore your hearing back to normal? It doesn't. I know. That's, I don't want to go get one of those. It's, always, it's hard enough to hear the symphony now as you get older because you lose a little bit of that higher frequency, lower. I mean, you just don't respond to sounds quite as fast. So it does, it does help um, a lot of different areas in your hearing as far as keeping that nerve active. Um, giving a sound um, will keep that nerve firing and hopefully give you better understanding as you go on. How long does it take to get used to hearing, a hearing aid? Usually a couple weeks. We um, do have a trial period on hearing aids, so if um, you ever purchase a hearing aid, a prescriptive hearing aid, you will have that trial period to try it out and see if it works for you, um, which I think is important. So a couple weeks. So Dr. Lynn, how do I know if it's more serious? Like I really need to go get a doctor to see me. I, I know like I have ringing in the ears. I know some people have loss of balance. When, well, when is the time you gotta say, man, I gotta take this a little more seriously than just going to the local CVS and picking up a hearing aid? Well, um, that, that brings up an important point as to whether or not we should forego that examination. I, I personally feel uh, it's better serving the house of medicine to, um, improve the availability of hearing aids out there because the problem is is so enormous with hearing loss and and now there's the uh relationship with early onset dementia associated with it but for individuals who have say chronic ear problems one side hears worse than the other um ear pain 
drainage, uh, heaven forbid, bad headaches, facial weakness, um, imbalance. Those things all point to, to the need for further evaluation for uh, potential underlying reversible or treatable pathologies that may cause the hearing loss or at, be at the root of the hearing loss. Well, you said two things I want to go back to. You said, heaven forbid, related to a headache and hearing loss. Why is that? Well, because sometimes with uh, certain patients with asymmetric hearing loss, um, it, it's a result of a, a benign tumor along the hearing and balanced nerves called the vestibular schwannoma. They're, they're not that common. However, uh, that's one thing we, we don't want to miss. Um, additionally, somebody loses their hearing in one year suddenly. I can't tell you the amount of times I've, I've seen emergency uh, room patients refer to me several months after the fact that lost their hearing suddenly and are given antihistamines or nasal sprays because they say, oh, you have eustachian tube dysfunction when the truth is they lost their hearing suddenly um, of the nerve variety. About two to four percent of those cases are due to a vestibular schwannoma or a brain tumor. Something you want to go evaluate because surgically you can help address that, I take it. Yes, yeah, surgically or just knowing about it, I think is, is uh, a better option for these patients. Okay, now you also said something about dementia. Let's go back to that. You said if hearing loss can be associated with the onset of early dementia, help us tie that together. There have been several studies in the past and ongoing studies relating to hearing loss and, and um, memory loss and dementia. We found that these large studies have determined that relationship to be real. And so we're not exactly certain why that may happen. You can imagine uh, an elderly patient with hearing loss who's become more withdrawn socially um, and just chooses to avoid conversation. That in itself can predispose somebody to not think as clearly down the road in long term. Also, um, there's a theory out there regarding people's or individuals hearing loss that, that may mean that they are struggling to try to understand or follow conversations and taking, taking away that mental faculty from other parts of the brain may actually also uh, contribute to hearing loss and dementia. I'm sorry, dementia. Okay. So um, I do notice, and I think you hear this from patients, especially as they get older, that, that they don't quite have the same ability to hear the symphony and hear the fine notes. Is that a normal part of aging? That um, the majority of age-related hearing loss is typically at the high frequencies, and, and with that, you tend to lose some of the fine, uh, I guess, spectral envelope effects of, of hearing and processing. So things, will, things do sound differently as you lose your hearing with aging. So Dr. Fletcher, get a hearing aid. Are people normally fairly happy with those or do they just like, oh, this is what I wanted to have? So it depends on um, their expectations and their willingness to wear them. So if you're willing to wear them, go out and um, give them a good try and they're fit properly, that's the biggest thing is they're fit properly, um, then you tend to do really well with them. Um, a lot of patients love them and wear them every day and go about their day and they can hear a lot better. Okay, I'm just gonna say that sometimes I've seen people with hearing aids now that are so interesting because you can barely tell that they're there. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're so, I mean, my dad used to have hearing loss, it was big things that kind of looped around his ear, went into the ear, all that. And now they're so much smaller. Talk to me about what's the, first of all, that's pretty cool, mm -hmm. but what's the next phase of development going to look like in hearing aids? Hard to say. I tell patients all the time, I'm like, we've gotten to this point of technology with hearing aids that they have come so long from even the six years that I've been in the field. Um, smaller is not necessarily always better because people want connectivity to their iPhones. They want um, rechargeable batteries and all these things that uh, make their life easier with them. So you have to have a hearing device that's maybe a little bit bigger. So do the ones that are fit onto your eyeglasses work? Those aren't around anymore. Oh, they did, they died? Oh man, what happened? I guess it didn't work. <laughs> All right, so how long do they last once you buy them? Um, you, we, typically five to seven years, but if you take good care of them, you can get a, a, a good longer time. A longer All right, time. now here's yeah. the real question. How much, what's the range of cost for hearing aids? So like Dr. Lynn said, there are um, places that do that bundled effect, so they have their audiology services wrapped into it. So I would say anywhere from 2000 to $6,000, depending okay. on what, what so you get. That's a, that's a big range. And is there an advantage to spending $6,000? 
Yep, it's based off of your lifestyle and what your listening needs are. So our young workers that are constantly in difficult listening in situations, those um, more expensive devices are going to live with you. So that's... That's what you want. Okay, so I want to protect my hearing and I'm at Arrowhead Stadium. What should I do? You should wear your hearing protection. Um, roll down earplugs are okay. We okay. also do custom devices, so custom earplugs that are specific to your ear shape. Um, so those could be good as well. For my, little, my little ear pods, do those sound? No. Oh man, that is not the right answer. All right, let's tie the time for us to check in with Dr. Dana Hawkins, and we're coming back to our head in a minute. Medical Director of Infection Prevention Control, he's joining us for being on the road. We've got several numbers to look at today. Let we're, yeah. it's, now, wait a minute, Hawkins. Okay, okay, before we go to, let's start with the COVID numbers. Where are yeah. you today? Where are you? Um, I'm back up with, with my mother and father just uh, to celebrate the holidays. That, which is a great place to be. Just now, to be yeah. I'm going to do something because I saw you a few moments ago, and uh, you're not expecting this. You have to stand up. No. Yeah, come on, brother. you got to stand up for a minute. <laughs> just for a second. I wore a tidy whitey yeah. on this show. you got to stand up, brother. Come on. First, look at that. Okay. <laughs> oh, 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 there we go. Oh, rock, chalk, J, hawk, K, U. All right. All right. Yeah, well, that was good. People will be uh, will be keeping up to date with them this weekend. Good luck to them down in Battle for Atlanta, I think. All right. Well, let's go ahead. Now that we've had the uh, the pajama look, let's talk a look at the do the COVID numbers. How are we doing? You know, I, I do think we probably, we, we actually may be long lost brothers, Steve, because I started wearing glasses in fourth grade as well. Oh my so, God, we may be. You know, <laughs> the red hair, the glasses, uh, you know, the, the sci-fi stuff. I had uh, red hair when I was younger, a lot younger, as it turns out, or reddish. <laughs> reddish brown. <laughs> Um, so yeah, today uh, our numbers have been, you know, again, Steve, like we said, they're just not where we want them to be for active infections. Uh, but 22 active infections, two in the ICU, zero on the ventilator, still 19 in that recovery period. Again, I think cases have been trending up on a weekly basis nationally. Um, we know cases, uh, hospitalizations will trail cases by two, three, four weeks. So uh, we're just kind of keeping our fingers crossed, really continuing to promote uh, being up to date with the booster, as well as getting tested early and getting on Paxlovid. You know, th those are obviously all the right things. And, and uh, just to say, Dr. Fauci had what was probably his final news conference yesterday, because he's retiring as of January 1, and he said this is probably my final news conference. So first of all, hats off to the man, because he has been brilliant throughout this crisis. Yeah. And he's... He has had withering criticism for reasons that are like just yeah. not fa quite frankly, if you really understand the medical science behind this, are just completely unfounded. And yeah. um, has done, I think, a great job at just trying to tell us the truth as we knew it at any point in time. Remember, you and I have always said, we build the airplane while yeah. we fly it. And that guy, he was flying it. And uh, so that'll be a loss. But he said we look forward to a, maybe a hopefully not as bad of a winter as last year. Yeah, and I think that that's true. Hopefully not. Uh, we knew that with Delta, it was a huge surge in cases and hospitalizations. As we, we got further out from Delta into that Omicron surge, uh, less uh, less of a peak of surge of cases, but also less of a peak of those hospitalizations as well. And I would just like to point out, um, MMWR from CDC was has released a couple early articles specifically on this point. People who did take Paxlovid, whether vaccinated or unvaccinated, had a 50% less chance of going to the hospital. So we know that works. Get tested early, get on Paxlovid. Also, early data from the mono uh, bivalent boosters show there was an increase in the reduction of symptomatic COVID as well, which we know that um, uh, the vaccines don't protect against infection. They can have a minimal effect. And certainly early data from the bivalent boosters does show that can happen as well. So, Yeah, that was, I was interested to see that as well. And, and again, that was just coming out yesterday. But it was, it was good information to see that the bivalent may look better. Now, it was against more BA5 and a mixture of some other stuff, not as much as BA1.1 or BA1.111, whatever. And uh, still some concerns about XXF. But, but I think, nevertheless, that's all antibody stuff. The hospitalization and severe illness continues to show protection from the boosters and the bivalent being better than the uh, the former vaccine, uh, the former vaccines. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think there was a recent Science or Nature article, uh, I think it was looking at data from uh, macaques, I believe, but the data actually showed that there was an increase in the breath, an increase in the, um, the differences in antibodies created when getting those uh, bivalent vaccines for further protection as well. But, you know, for everything that we know, all the data continues to support the fact that those T cells continue to work. There are very little changes on those areas of the spike that the T cells uh, recognize. And that is really what gives us a lot of protection against severe disease and hospitalization. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we get caught up in this question of antibodies and all that and, and disease yeah. and not getting the disease. Absolutely. That's not the point of the vaccination. It was the point very, very early on when we thought we could help control it. But as more variants came along and people didn't follow the infection control guidelines, what ended up happening was we have the, the, the vaccine, the, the emphasis on vaccination is now much different. It's not so much about not acquiring the infection but minimizing the effect of the infection. So that's what we should be focusing on. I think people still get too caught up in whether or not there's disease transmission. No, not the point. It's yeah. how, we, how we can modulate how sick you get. All right, well, let's look, let's look at some of the flu and RSV data uh, as yeah. well, Hawkeye. Let's first of all take a look at flu, not the best graph. Yeah, so, you know, this is showing, and again, this is just the purple bars are any positive tests in the Kansas City division of University of Kansas Health System with the PCR or antigen test. Remember, we, we have two different tests. Uh, but unfortunately, just like you said, um, the purple bars, the total number is going up as well as the percentage. So um, we are just continuing to see an increase overall in the influenza circulation and positive testing uh, in our community at our health system. Yeah, bummer of a graph though, because we are seeing quite a bit of it. What about RSV, is it still rising or is it kind of plateaued? You know, I think just this one trend here, again, um, the percent positive has gone down. That's the black line. Um, the total overall number of cases uh, has kind of really stayed about the same. It seems to be on a downtrend. That is good news uh, as well. And again, the uh, orange or yellow uh, colored is the adults who are testing positive, either with the PCR or antigen. And the blue is the number of, of pediatrics. Uh, and again, this is the Kansas City Division. This is both in the hospital and in those ambulatory clinics. But this still signals that there is wide circulation of RSV going on right now as well. And I would say that from our admissions, we have about stable admissions for RSV in the hospital, around 10 or 11, uh, as we did last week, and the same thing for influenza for admissions as well, about 18, just under 20. Again, the majority of those are adults, but of course, we are more of an adult hospital. We have uh, many more adult beds compared to pediatric beds. So we have to put those uh, th those numbers into context as well. Yeah, good points all, all, all around. And, and so your thoughts on Dr. Fauci, because I know as an infectious disease doctor, you've long admired him. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, from the, from the early stages, you know, with, with HIV and that epidemic that you lived through, um, he's just been a, a voice of reason of calmness of really looking and dealing at this with the science um, unfortunately as we know the pandemic has really been politicized and there was i think and i believe undue uh reaction to him and, and animosity but it was really continuing with the science uh really just a consummate uh, uh, civil servant and really just wanting to have uh, the best health promoting the best science for all Americans, but also for people around the world, you know, with the HIV initiatives, obviously with helping to uh, get uh, Operation Warp Speed going to get those vaccines that we now have that we can deliver to other parts of the world as well. So um, just a consummate servant and I think um, a, hero, a hero to many, um, despite all of the, uh, the uh, unneeded or uh, unbacked um, animosity and criticism towards him. Yeah, he didn't He didn't deserve the criticism he got, but he sure has had a great life of public service and has done a great job helping yeah. guide us through yeah. multiple different pandemic or epidemics here in the U.S., including several influenza, bird flu, yeah. avian flu, yeah. um, I mean, SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2. I mean, I, the guy has been yeah. a, a remarkable career. All right, Alexa still said, any reporter questions? If not, let's jump to our other ones, our community questions.
We are getting so many great community questions. This is a topic that clearly is striking a chord in a lot of our viewers. Um, the first one comes from Kim Moore Bosley, who would like to know, is there a correlation between hearing loss and dementia? Well, we just heard that, I think, from Dr. Lynn earlier. Mm -hmm. There is a correlation. One we don't completely understand, Dr. Lynn, is it withdrawal from society, or is there also a physiologic issue? Yes, there, there is um, the, a correlation between uh, hearing loss and dementia. I think that is fairly well established. Um, I, I personally feel that uh, with some degrees of hearing loss, even ones that don't bother the individual, I think it's important to, to look into the degree of hearing loss and provide an attempt at amplification or use of hearing aids of, of any sort to help that out. Um, I think the release of the over-the-counter hearing aids will allow easier access to that amplification and help uh, mitigate those effects of, of dementia. Sam has a great question. Sam wants to know, he, he has hearing loss in both ears, so he would like to know if he has to wear two hearing aids or can he get away with just one? Dr. Fletcher. I oh, I'm sorry. Well, Fletcher, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, yes, wearing hearing aids in both of your ears is important. Our brain uses what's going on in both ears to um, locate where sound's coming from and a lot of different auditory processing things. So wearing two hearing aids is definitely important if you have hearing loss in both. Sarah wants to, um, has some more questions about the price. Earlier we mentioned some prices that made some people's eyes pop. Um, first of all, can you reiterate how much hearing aids cost? And then Sarah would like to know why they cost so much and how much does insurance typically cover if, if you could talk a little bit about that um so they are they range in price from two thousand to six thousand um, dollars depending on your services and follow-up visits and all that kind of stuff um, like our clinic does a bundled service um, they cost so much because you get the expertise of the audiologist fitting the device um, they are like little computers in your ears mm -hmm. um, insurance doesn't typically cover them I think a big part of that is Medicare doesn't cover them so maybe once Medicare gets on board and helps out a little bit then maybe the rest of the commercials will when you how, describe how much, it like hang on Alexa, how much yeah. does it cost to just do you think go to a drugstore and pick some hearing aids up now so there's a difference. There's the over-the-counter, which are ranging from around 300 for one to $1,000 for one. Um, and then there are another separate device that's just an amplifier. And those are your under $100. Okay. And yeah. so just to put it in perspective, you think about it, your new iPhones cost $800 or $1,000. Mm -hmm. And they do a lot of cool stuff. But right. imagine the hearing aid is a fraction of the size of an iPhone, but yet incredibly sophisticated. Mm -hmm. So sure. yeah, I think the, 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 you're probably paying a little bit, I'm going to guess, Dr. Lynn, for just the technology and the size. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there's, there's a deeper, deeper portion or there's a different layer to that question that was asked. Uh, number one, 30 to 40 percent of the cost of the uh, hearing aids you get in a bundled plan are, is, is the cost of the labor and uh, work and tune-ups that are required for the following one to four years. Um, additionally, there's the research and development component of the hearing aids. but there's also, unfortunately, a, a logistical component to it where um, until October of this year, hearing aids were, were highly regulated. Uh, that created a little bottleneck um, regarding how you could get them. And to complicate matters, um, uh, only about 84% of the, the prescription type hearing aids are created by four to five only manufacturers. So there's a pseudo monopoly effect uh, also um, taking place there. And finally, as Christina had mentioned, uh, Medicare typically does not cover them. And that allows um, the prices to go up without Medicare or insurers typically um, who can negotiate and contract on behalf of the patient and themselves. Um, those prices are going to are going to get driven up. Uh, the the White House had created this over-the-counter hearing aid policy to help open up the bottleneck, essentially, mm -hmm. and, and drive the cost down with competition. Uh, and you can bet in Washington D.C. that those four to five uh, hearing aid manufacturers fought tooth and nail. Um, additionally, I've I've taken a peek at some legislation out there. The, the White House would also like to um, like CMS or Medicare to cover. Uh, patients with 
moderately severe to profound hearing loss, which actually puts you in a cochlear implant range. Um, that hasn't passed uh, last I checked. Alexis. When it comes to the over-the-counter shopping for a device, um, Travis wants to know, are there specific features that he should look for or ask for? Do you have a lot of options when they're over-the-counter? So it's kind of a hard question um, because they're rolling them out more and more now that it just came into effect. Um, there are going to be ones that have more technology inside them and there's going to be ones that don't have a whole lot of technology inside them. They're very basic. They're going to be, um, you can change the base, the treble, the volume. Um, so I think that it's hard to say. We're going to have to see what, see what happens with reviews and things like that. Ruth Allen uh, would like some clarification on how you would define background noise or a situation with background noise. So a situation with background noise would be you go to a restaurant um, and there's the clanking of the dishes, there's the server talking, there's another table around. That's a um, situation with background noise. Or just simply at your house, somebody's doing the dishes and you're trying to watch TV and you're trying to have a conversation. Any kind of noise that's going around you when you're trying to um, converse, that's considered situations where there's background noise. And would you typically say, this is another question that Ruth had on conjunction with that, is if there's someone around you who keeps talking louder, is that a sign that they're experiencing hearing loss? Um, the people are talking louder to you. You know how no, somebody, like you know, it's like somebody's like, God, that person talks really loud exactly. in any conversation. Is that can they just not hear them, themselves talk? So there, so voice is not always um, correlated with hearing loss. Some people are just loud talkers, um, but okay. it's worth a shot of getting your getting your hearing checked. Hey guys, when you just real quick, when you when you saw the uh, video with Alexis in the studio, yes. they also wanted to look at the bony conduction. Talk to us about the importance of how well your how much the ears working and that bone part behind your ear. What's that about? So bone conduction tests the um, inner ear, the cochlea. Um, it tells us how you're nervous hearing. So we want to make sure that when we pro push sound through the outside of your ear and through the bone, that it correlates, that it's the same. Um, where if it's not the same and there's these big gaps, that means we need to see Dr. Lin or one of our surgeons. That was a really interesting part of the test. I didn't know, I'm not a doctor, clearly. I didn't know I could hear through the bone in my ear. Like I could hear what they were saying when there was nothing in my ear. Yeah, it was pretty weird mm -hmm. it, as a person who didn't know a lot about how that works, which is, brings me to Janet Coy's question. She wants to know, are hearing tests typically covered by insurance? The test, not the hearing aid. Hearing tests, yes, are typically covered by insurance. Okay. Yearly. Um, a yearly hearing mm -hmm. test. Okay. Uh, Beverly Van Horn has a great question about ringing in her ears. She says she has ringing in her ears that began about nine months ago. She wants to know if that will ever go away. Boy, that's a frustrating thing when that happens. Yeah, I get it all the time. Dr. Lynn, is it ever going to go away? I've had mine for like 20 years. <laughs> well, uh, as I tell my patients, Ringing the ears doesn't really come from the ears. It comes from the brain. Uh, most of the time in response to some degree of hearing loss where the brain is deprived of that sensation of sound to stimulate it and uh, similar to a phantom limb phenomenon, the brain makes its own sound. Unfortunately, once your brain perceives it, I wouldn't say hears it, uh, it it's in the ear of the beholder. Um, you're, you're always gonna find it if you try to find it. Um, so. It, it, it doesn't go away, but what happens is it, it becomes less noticeable to you over time, typically. Um, but if you stop and think about it, you're going to find it. Is that the same when, you're, when you have an, an injury to your ear? I know when my dad was a teenager, someone fired a, a gun right near him. They were out hunting, and he's had ringing in his ear ever since. But is that in his brain? I always assumed it was because his ear was damaged. Well... What happens when you have an acoustic trauma like that, a firecracker goes off in, in somebody's uh -huh. hand or next to somebody or, or uh, a loud noise occurs, um, you get a temporary and sometimes permanent uh, change in your hearing. Um, but when you get the temporary change in your hearing, your brain again loses that input and, and generates the, the sound to fill that void at least briefly. Um, and if it's a permanent hearing loss, then, then it tends to stay. Um, Jean has a really good question, especially with how everybody's always wearing earbuds now, nowadays. Um, how do you wear earbuds or earphones when you have a hearing aid? 
So a lot of hearing aids are Bluetooth compatible to your um, phone. Um, so you can stream your phone calls to your ears or your music to your ears. Um, that's usually pretty standard now. I have one last community question that just came in, and this one is for Dr. Hawkinson um, or Dr. Stites. It's from um, Angela Yink Saylor, who would like to know, is the new Pfizer COVID injection not as effective? I mean, not as effective as their prior ones. So I think, I think the question is, the, and we'll, we'll cover both Pfizer and Moderna in this question, Hawkeye. Because I think earlier today we were pointing out with the new evidence that suggests actually the yeah. bivalent may be more effective, not less. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think more more effective in what we were talking about with against symptomatic infection, which we know uh, the other one certainly that effect wears down over time. It wanes probably because of the antibody levels, just like Dr. Stite said. But we are really looking at those rates of hospitalization and severe disease. And for all accounts and purposes, we do expect them to continue to have high rates of protecting you from hospitalization and severe disease. We are waiting for that data and analysis right now. And I, I think, just, I, do you think there's a difference between the COVID uh, between both Pfizer and Moderna anymore? I mean, it, 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 so far we've seen minimal differences. Sometimes you can see there is a slightly statistical but not clinical difference between the two. Yeah. I, I'm gonna bet it's gonna land on the same spot. I have one more yeah, question. I agree with oh. you, and I think that's why they say that they are interchangeable. I agree with you. And again, remember, so many people have been infected and reinfected. That also contributes to increasing your immunity as well. So, uh, But I think for all accounts and purposes, just like you said, Dr. Stites, they are equivalent. Alexis, yeah, another question. One more question. Uh, my girlfriends and I are always talking about how we're worried our kids are gonna have hearing loss earlier in life or more hearing loss because um, they're always wearing earbuds and we're always telling our sons to turn down their earbuds. Are you seeing younger and younger patients that have hearing loss? Dr. Lynn, what do you think? Yes, um, I, I think if you look at um, nationally over the past uh, you know, two decades, with the earbuds in place, I think that is contributing to increased rates of hearing loss at a younger a younger age. Uh, my typical rule of thumb has been try not to turn it up beyond 60% to 70%. Although they, they do make some earbuds uh, for kids that, that limit the output. So here's a question for you guys. You know, the new um, iWatch, has this decibel meter on it and tells you when you're in trouble for hearing. Are those things reliable? And talk to us about this thing about decibels and hearing loss and how to know when it's too loud because, you know, I'm not sure people really have that filter. So, um, <laughs> I'm not certain how accurate the decibel meter is in an I iPhone watch um, or an iWatch. Um, the, the national standard from OSHA states that uh, hearing protection must be worn and time, uh, expo time of exposure must be documented above 80 decibels. Um, uh, it, according to OSHA, you, you cannot spend more than eight hours working in an environment um, con uh, consecutively for eight hours uh, above uh, at 90 decibels. And every time the decibel level goes up by five, that number is reduced that time is reduced in half. So at 95 decibels, you, you can't be there for more than four hours. Um, so there's there's a um, there's the decibel level and the um, time of exposure that both play an important role in, in, in permanent trauma to your ears. So Arrowhead Stadium could be dangerous. Yeah, it could be dangerous. <laughs> I'm still, I still go, guys. I'm, I'm going to confess them, but I already have to see you, so. Uh. You know, I'm telling you, when Mahomes goes to Kelsey, you just got to cheer. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, this has been a wonderful conversation today, and, and I want to thank both of our guests for being here. We're going to have to have these guys back, Alexis, because people are going to want to know more and more about this, mm -hmm. and it's such a, it's such a really, really big deal. Yeah. Uh, let's get some final thoughts. Dr. Lynn, we're going to start with you. So um, hearing loss in this country and nationally is becoming more of a global problem. Um, I think increased awareness has really been sparked by the notion that dementia and hearing loss have an association. Um, and finally, I, I do think serving the House of Medicine that the over-the-counter hearing aids has unleashed a, a greater 
access to amplification for individuals, just like uh, the reader glasses have um, have helped people, such as myself, who have problems reading small, fine print. Um, I think we're heading in the right direction, and, and hopefully insurers will also take a closer look, in, including Medicare, at providing coverage for hearing aids. But as as we all know, you know, CMS has a limited bucket uh, to pay out of. Yeah, and then maybe it'll spark some innovation as well when you have these so many more people coming into the marketplace. Sure. Dr. Fletcher, final thoughts. I think that the takeaway from here is that if you're having difficulties hearing, get your hearing tested. Regardless if you're going to go over the counter or hearing aids, audiologists can lead you in the right path as far as what's going on with your ears. Yeah, that, that sounds that, that sounds very, very like a very smart thing to do. Let's get it figured <laughs> out, and it means I have to go get my follow-up appointment. Dr. Hawkinson. Yeah, uh, thank you to our guests. You know, we know all of your senses are so important. Uh, touch, smell, taste, vision, hearing, obviously. You know, Dr. Lynn and his colleagues have helped me out so much with removal of wax from my ears. Maybe that's your problem, Steve. Maybe you need that. <laughs> yeah. um, and I, I'm overall worried about wearing my uh, AirPods and also those little things that go into your ear for the IFB for the show, too. So hopefully I won't get too much more hearing loss. But would like to just comment uh, again, we've had some good questions about the vaccines and we talked about them. The vaccines right now continue to look like they are uh, providing that protection, even a little bit more against um, symptomatic disease, even if it's for a short period of time. But I think that's very important because we are getting into the holiday season now where people will be traveling and maybe going to other people's houses who are maybe more at risk of disease. But also importantly, Paxlovid has shown to help reduce that risk of hospitalization uh, for those that are vaccinated, unvaccinated, and especially those at high risk. So get tested early and get on treatment, but most importantly, keep up with your, uh, your vaccinations. Excellent advice. And I just want to say a word of thanks to our guests today. And we're going, uh, I think, go ahead, Hawk. Sorry, I thought we had one more thing too. I would, uh, uh, would like oh. to say that congratulations <laughs> to Rockers, who recently won uh, the state uh, 4A, uh, the class 4A or 4 in Missouri uh, soccer championship. Uh, they did repeat, and uh, my son was on the team and was able to, to get a medal. So uh, congratulations uh, to Rockers there for that repeat state soccer championship. And congratulations, and congratulations to the, to the proud papa. So um, I do want to say a special thing, because it is Thanksgiving, and thanks to our guests and to all our outstanding guests, but also thanks to our amazing studio crew. You don't get to see these great folks behind the screen every day. They do remarkable work to all the people who help prepare the scripts, get the show up and going. Um, Thanksgiving, thank you. Um, before we say goodbye, I want to sh share something um, pretty special with you all. You may have heard about the Phillies. Now, I'm not talking about the baseball team, though I did want them to have won the World Series and not those terrible Astros. But anyway, not the baseball team or the cheesesteak sandwiches. These are the awards given out to the Kansas City area not-for-profits not doing amazing things around the metro. Nonprofit Connect, the group behind the awards, started out in the 1970s as the Council of Philanthropy. Philanthropy. Phillies, get it? And we are so proud because we recently won three Philly awards. One was for our statewide chief medical officer news coverage on the spread of COVID across Kansas. That was one. The other two were for called for the show called Sunny Says, featuring Jessica Lovell's adorable daughter, Sunny. Sunny, you are so awesome. Yeah, your mom's pretty good too, but anytime you want to be on the program, Sunny, come right on. <laughs> One of those shows was the show How to Be Safe on Halloween, the other on why it's safe to be, to be vaccinated. I also remember she did a great one about masking. We're going to share that video with you again in just a moment as a reminder that it's not too late to get vaccinated against COVID. Remember, you get your flu shots while you're here or while you're there as well, getting that COVID shot, because you know, you ought to do what Sunny says. Alexis, back to you. Dr. Stites, are you gonna sleep with that award under your pillow? <laughs> no, ma'am, I'm gonna leave it down here because the truth is this studio deserves it. It's I'm just got, I just got a big mouth. <laughs> 
<laughs> Congratulations to you on the Philly Awards. Congratulations to Dr. Hawkinson's son and Dr. Hawkinson for raising a pretty cool kid who won the state soccer championship. And we want to thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, we love our viewers. We're going to be off tomorrow and Friday enjoying Thanksgiving with our families. We hope you have a wonderful holiday. We'll be back with you next Monday morning at 8 a.m. Jess will be back. She's enjoying some much needed time off with another morning medical update. We'll see you on Monday morning. Have a happy Thanksgiving. And here again is an encore to Sunny Says It's Safe to Vaccinate. Mm -mm. Hi They're friends, hilarious. it's Sunny and Sunny says it's safe to vaccinate. But don't take it from me, I'm just a kid. Take it from these super smart docs. Hey Sunny, what's up? Like Dr. Angela Myers at Children's Mercy Hospital. She really knows her stuff. Sunny, there are so many doctors and scientists that have been working so hard to make sure this vaccine is safe and effective. We have already vaccinated over a million kids. I was brave, I got my shot. Sunny says, it doesn't really hurt, just a quick pinch, and then you're on your way. By the way, it's okay if you and your parents have lots of questions, but Sunny says, make sure you go to the right places for answers, and make sure you're asking the right people, like your pediatrician. My parents talk to mine. Hi, Dr. Lauer. Hi, Sunny. I told your parents that the risks from COVID were much scarier than any risk from the vaccine. You'll be safer after you get it. Hey, Sonny, are your friends following your lead? You bet they are, like my friend, Tommy Ralph. Hey, Sonny, I got my shot, look at my guns. Tommy Ralph and Antonio did it for their grandparents. They died after battling COVID. They really miss them and want to make them proud. Be strong like me and get the shot. And be strong and brave like Isabella. Hey, Sonny, check out my vaccination card. Oh yeah, baby. And her brother. I did it and so can you. Remember, Sunny says your parents want the best for you. Tell all your friends to listen to mom and dad and their doctors, not just anyone on the internet. Your parents might want you to wait to get your shot, but Sunny says keep wearing your mask so you can stay safe and healthy. Let's get vaccinated so we can all get back to normal. Well, the new normal, but we're cool with that. Remember, Sunny says it's safe to vaccinate. Coming up Monday on the Morning Medical Update. It was a one, two, three punch for Alice Marshall. I'm Jessica Lovell, coming up on the next Morning Medical Update. How treatment for her rare face cancer led to a devastating colon diagnosis, and then it hit her lungs. Now she's thanking her medical team who's kept her in the clear. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and open mics with Dr. Stein's podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.